All right, can everyone hear me? Fantastic. And I just also want to confirm that the slides did indeed advance. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to the FH Foundation for inviting me to be with all of you tonight and bring to you the topic of genetics of FH. Um, here is the overview of what I would like to accomplish with all of you tonight. I really see that I hope to take you through a journey learning a lot about the basics of genetics, giving you some groundwork on which that you can really truly fully understand the genetics of FH specifically, how this relates to you and your family, the availability of genetic testing and genetic counseling, highlight information about and how very important it is, as well as the Cascade FH registry, and then tie up with some very important topics that I'm sure many of you have thought about and dealt with, with the fact that FH is a genetic condition, talking about family dynamics, the way that this condition can affect families, and tie up with giving all of you some resources and just making sure all of you know, um, I hope you all have a chance to ask me any question you need tonight, but also I hope to continue to be a resource to you in the future. So starting right up with um, Genetics 101, I wanted to just give you some background information. And some of you may have seen a diagram like this before. It's called a karyotype. And you can see here that these are the chromosomes. They come in pairs, two number ones, two number twos, and so on and so forth, down to the last pair, the sex chromosomes. This is a male who has XY. And the chromosomes are important because we inherit one member of each chromosome pair from our parents. The chromosomes, as you can see here, are the very important structures built up of DNA, or the double helix, that is really the molecule of life. Single units of DNA, called genes, are really heredity that code for traits like our hair color, our height, our eye color, and also genes within every single cell of the body, our heart cells, our blood cells, etc make proteins, and the protein is really the, the molecule that does the, the job in the body. And you can see that typically that DNA code should be able to tell the cell how to make a working protein. But when there is what's called a genetic variation, also sometimes called a genetic mutation, this can leave that DNA code to be wrong and will not be able to tell the cell how to make the right protein. This can sometimes lead toward a completely missing protein or a non-functional one that is not working as well as it should. Now something that has been very fascinating to learn over the course of the past few years, and this is really learned after the Human Genome Project was conducted and completed in 2003, and then just all the additional research that has been able to be built upon that, is that no one is a perfect genetic specimen, quote unquote. And every single human being has up to maybe even 50 significant variants in their DNA code, in their human genome, predisposing us to possibly things like diabetes or high blood pressure or FH. And I'd just like to start off every single talk I give by letting people know that every single individual has genetic variations. Some of them may cause us to be a carrier for a condition. Some of them may cause us to not be able to metabolize medications the right way. But we all have genetic changes. I'd like to move on next to something that is very important for not only every patient with FH, but really every single person. And that is the family tree or pedigree. Well, why is this important? Family history is a very, very powerful tool that can help a person and their family specifically focus in on what they need to be concerned about. And we know that, very interestingly, not only does family history reflect the shared genetic changes that we have with our family, 
but also the shared environment. So oftentimes family members may have similar environmental risk factors that we all come into um, contact with based on the fact that we live in close proximity with each other. Oftentimes also family members have common or shared behaviors, whether it be a similar type of diet or smoking or other types of habits. And the bottom line is that knowing your family's health history can truly save your life. Now the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention about 10 years ago conducted a survey to respondents asking them how important did they think family history was to their health. And as you can see here in this graphic, almost 100% of people said that family history was at least very, if not to a lesser extent, somewhat important. And you can see that a very high amount of people have knew their family history for their, for their mom and their dad and their brothers and sisters. As it went further out into the family, they didn't know it quite as well. But when they were asked did they actually collect this information, to have in a file and to have for their medical record and to share with the next generations, you can see that really only one in three people said that they had actively done that. And so about 10 years ago, the Surgeon General at the time, Richard Carmona, decided to launch a national initiative to really encourage all families to learn more about their family health history. And they developed a tool called My Family Health Portrait, which can still be found at this website here. And in addition to developing this tool, they also declared Thanksgiving as National Family History Day, really because you know this is one of the major days out of the 365 days of the year that families do come together. And obviously, this isn't the main focus is to talk about our medical histories and our health, but it does give a very good opportunity to be with our family and to share this information, in addition to other holidays and family reunions. This shows the actual My Family Health Portrait website. And it's really wonderful because you can create a family history. But not only that, we know that family histories are dynamic and they change. And so you can also open a saved history file and update it. You can share it with your healthcare provider. You can share it with your family members. And this just shows you an example of what a family tree might look like. Um, this is some information that I inputted for my own family. So once again, I would really encourage all of you to get your family pedigree in a format like this to use for yourself, to get in your medical chart, and to also share with your relatives. Now, in thinking about what is important to collect on your pedigree or your family tree, you really need to go back at least three generations, if not more, to be able to fully establish patterns of conditions that may be running in the different generations of your family. It's important to document ages of family members, health status of age, and age at diagnosis for certain conditions. And this is really very, very important. If a person is diagnosed with a health condition at a younger than typical age of onset, that automatically gives us a clue that the condition could be genetic. It's also important to document why people passed away, the age they passed away, and for a condition such as FH, you need to focus in on red flags that you're wondering would be in the family history. For FH specifically, this would be something like premature coronary artery disease or sudden cardiac death. Family's racial and ethnic background is also a big clue a lot of times to us in the genetics world as to what condition may be playing a role in the family. Well, certain individuals of different ethnic background, like Ashkenazi Jewish individuals, have a much higher chance to have FH than people of other ethnic backgrounds. And the bottom line is that family history is very imperative in helping us diagnose a condition, viewing what the inheritance pattern may be in the family. It's a quick visual to right away identify who is at risk in the family. And when thinking about genetic testing, it helps us pick the most informative family member to start genetic testing initiation. We always want to start genetic testing with, number one, someone who has an official diagnosis of the condition. And if there are more than one person in the family with a diagnosis, we like to select the person really with the most severe presentation, the earliest age of onset. 
because that will give us the highest sensitivity to find all of the different genetic variants that may be playing a role in the family. Now this is a pedigree chart displaying what typical autosomal dominant inheritance looks like. And this is indeed the way that the most common type of autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia or familial hypercholesterolemia is inherited. And you can see that typically affected individuals are in every generation of a family. In a pedigree, use squares to represent males and circles to represent females, and you can see both genders are affected. And first-degree relatives have a 50% chance of inheriting the predisposing genetic variant. First-degree relatives are our parents, our brothers and sisters, and our children. Now, the genetic variant itself does not skip a generation. It cannot skip, for example, from a grandfather down to a grandson. It would always be in that middle generation. However, some people with the genetic variant may not go on to get the clinical symptoms or signs, which we call the clinical phenotype. Now, another thing is that with autosomal dominant inheritance, it is equally transmitted by both men and women. To review, familial hypercholesterolemia is a very common genetic cause of premature coronary heart disease, which is due to lifelong elevated plasma, which means in the blood, low-density lipoprotein, or LDL, cholesterol levels. And it is an autosomal dominant condition. We do see a gene dosage effect. So there are multiple different types of individuals with FH. Homozygotes means an individual has two copies of the exact same genetic variant or mutation. Compound heterozygotes have two genetic variants, but they aren't the same. They're two different genetic variants. Heterozygotes means that they have one specific genetic variant, a very large risk for them. And we know that with homozygotes and compound heterozygotes, they have a much more severe clinical phenotype much higher LDL cholesterol, and earlier onset of heart disease. Overall, FH is more than 90% penetrant, meaning if a person has that genetic predisposing variant, it's a very high likelihood, over 90%, that they will have signs and symptoms if they remain untreated. And as you can see, the prevalence is quite common for heterozygous FH. And newer studies have even told us that these numbers may be more common than we ever knew, with at least over half a million patients in the United States with FH, many of which, unfortunately, remain undiagnosed. I just wanted to show you an example pedigree of a patient with FH. And this is what, during a genetic counseling session, we would draw out for every single patient with FH. You can see we draw an arrow denoting what we call our proband or index patient. And here, the proband is a 46-year-old female who had a myocardial infarction, or MI, at age 34, treated with coronary artery bypass drafting of three vessels, had been diagnosed with high cholesterol since she was the age of 10. You can see in her sibship, she had an older brother who passed away, an older sister with FH, and an older brother who was diagnosed with high cholesterol with an LDL of 250, really at the time of birth. And you can see how a pedigree just very easily and visually documents the condition in the family. We use different symbols to denote different types of conditions that can run in families with FH, like a heart attack, coronary artery disease, and high cholesterol. And the other great thing about the pedigree is it very easily helps us identify who is at risk, and who would need screened in this family. So I'm going to go ahead and stop for our first round of questions. Hello. So um, we had a few questions, one of which I, I think was um, very much relevant to this section, uh, but you might have answered. And Pat, do we have any questions? Oh. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sorry, can you hear me? Kat, I think you might still be on mute. Hello, can you hear me? 
Sorry, I had you uh, turned off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Can everybody hear me now? So we had, we do have a few questions. I, um, a couple of them I'm going to hold till later because I think you might um, address those. Uh, one question was, was very relevant to the subject and that is, but you, you may have answered it, can FH skip a generation? But I don't know if you want to expand on, on how that can appear to happen absolutely. between the phenotype and the genotype. Sure, absolutely. So as you can see, um, you know, in this pedigree of the autosomal dominant inheritance, the genetic variant itself would never be able to skip a generation. Like I said, it would not from the top generation down to the bottom generation in this pedigree. If a person does not inherit the predisposing genetic variant for FH, it cannot go down to their children because it is not in their bloodline. However, sometimes the pedigrees can be difficult to interpret or your family history might be difficult to interpret because we can see people who have a genetic variant but don't have, you alluded to, Pat, that clinical phenotype. So they don't necessarily have very high LDL cholesterol. And this may be due to the fact that there can be protective genetic variants in that person, kind of masking the true FH genetic predisposing variants in that person. Um, but no, the condition itself, the genetic variant itself, would not skip a generation. If a person did not inherit it from their parents, it will not go on to their children. But this has really helped with genetic testing, which indeed I will talk about in the next section. So it's Kat here. I think we'll, we'll move to the next section because I think some of the questions might be answered in the next we can All right, ready. great. So the next topic we are going to cover is genetic testing. And I'll start with just giving some basics about genetic testing and then delve in deeper to FH genetic testing. Now, there are really two main categories when I think about genetic testing, overall overarching categories, and that is clinical and research genetic testing. Some of you may have enrolled in research genetic testing protocols, which are research protocols over the years, where really biomedical researchers are trying to discover novel causes of genetic conditions or characterize more about the genes that we know cause certain genetic conditions. All of this research genetic testing has really allowed genetic tests to move into the clinical realm. And in clinical genetic testing, we know that this is conducted by a clinical, certified, quality assured laboratory that has to meet certain national standards. And so that is really the difference between the two. It's very important for the healthcare provider to choose the right genetic test and the right lab because not all labs are created equal. We do know that genetic tests are often covered by insurance, and it's really wonderful because a lot of the genetic testing companies that I work with and order genetic testing from for my patients authorization programs where they will be able to check your insurance and tell myself and the patient how much out-of-pocket expense they may expect, if any. We do know that interpretation and implications of genetic tests are not always straightforward or black and white. And therefore, it's very helpful to have both pre- and post-test genetic counseling when going through genetic testing. Now, when we think about FH genetic testing, again, there are kind of these two categories. And one would be for a person who has a clinical diagnosis of FH, we would call that diagnostic testing. So this is a person who has a clinical diagnosis. They're going through FH genetic testing to find their specific genetic variant, and then that positive result may be able to confirm the diagnosis. Once that specific genetic variant has been found in the probate or index patient, that information can be used to perform what's called predictive or pre-symptomatic testing of at-risk relatives. Again, testing should definitely begin with an affected individual if at all possible because the best genetic test result accuracy information is going to be gleaned by testing someone who has the diagnosis where we have the highest likelihood to find the exact cause in the family. 
And then once that information is found, we would perform what's called family-specific targeted genetic testing for all at-risk family members for that positive variant to see if they did or did not inherit it. It's really been amazing over the course of the past decade to see the exponential growth in the availability of genetic tests. And again, really kind of building off the completion of the Human Genome Project, which was completed in 2003, and just based on the amazing technology we have, we now have thousands of genetic tests available to our patients, and they're becoming improved and at lower costs all the time. So now digging into FH genetics. Now, this is a picture of a cell in your liver. And so you can kind of see here the yellow membrane of the cell. And these green molecules here with the V-shape are the LDL receptor protein. And this is the very most important protein that when it is not made properly or not made at all, can lead toward the diagnosis of FH. We do know that there are other important genes and proteins affected that can cause FH, one of which is this ApoB. ApoB is very important. It's a part of the LDL cholesterol that helps the LDL cholesterol bind to this receptor to get it cleared out of the blood system and into the liver cell. And if that part of that molecule is not structured the correct way, it won't be able to bind to the receptor to get cleared out of the blood system. And so the overall genetic mutations that can cause someone to have FH really can affect these receptors, the LDL receptor, from being made at all, or from functioning the right way, or from this molecule being able to bind to the LDL receptor to get into the cell and out of the blood. This table summarizes the main genetic causes of FH. And you can see here in the first column the different genes, the chromosome they are located on. And you can just see these are all on numbered chromosomes, which means they can affect both men and women. By far, the most common cause is this LDL receptor. Now, when we do genetic testing, the likelihood to be able to identify a patient's specific genetic variant really depends on how sure we are that they have FH in the first place. And so if a patient has a definite diagnosis of FH, we have a pretty good shot at identifying their genetic etiology. If a person has probable or even just possible FH, that chance to get a positive genetic test result goes down. And you can see here in this last row that much of the genetics of FH do remain unknown, and this is where we want to focus a lot more intensive research efforts so we can learn more about why other patients may have the clinical diagnosis of FH, which could hopefully even lead toward better drug therapies. Some research has shown that even the specific type of genetic change affecting that LDL receptor may change how severe a patient's cardiovascular disease is. This is a diagram from a research study of men with FH. And you can see here, this solid line represents what we call a null mutation. In other words, no LDL receptor was made. Here, with the dotted line, this is a defective LDLR. So some of it may still be working, but just not as well. And you can see here that the time, or how many years the male lived without having cardiovascular disease was less for those men with that null or more severe type of mutation. So sometimes knowing the type of mutation can give us information about prognosis. Now, a really, really in important concept to understand is this whole idea of overlap between those with a clinical diagnosis based on LDL cholesterol those who have both a clinical diagnosis and positive genetic test result, and then those who may have a positive genetic test result, but yet don't have high cholesterol. So if we start up here with the orange, these would be people who have a clinical diagnosis based on LDL cholesterol and other findings, 
but don't have an identified genetic mutation. And this could be because they fit into that category where we just don't understand all of the genetic causes of FH yet. Here in the middle in red, we have the overlap where patients have both a positive genetic test result and a clinical diagnosis. In this category, we would want to make sure when we're doing family testing to use DNA testing and it will get the most specific, accurate information for who is and who is not an FH patient in the family. And then finally, we have some patients who may have a genetic variant associated with FH, yet they don't have elevated LDL at that time. We need to continue to monitor these patients, but it's possible that individuals in this category have protective genetic variants, leading them to have an overall less severe clinical spectrum. With genetic testing for FH, again, it's not a perfect test, but we see this, honestly, in pretty much every genetic condition we work with in the field of genetics. Again, we know with LDLR testing, we can identify a lot of people with a definitive clinical diagnosis, less if their diagnosis is less certain. ApoB and PCSK9 are two other important, yet less common, genetic causes. Interestingly, there may be more than one major gene variant or mutation running in a family causing the FH phenotype. So again, it is really important to test the person with the most severe phenotype because if there is more than one gene mutation, that would be the person we'd have the best shot at identifying it in. Negative testing does not exclude the diagnosis. Targeted screening in certain research studies such as in a pediatric population, has been shown to lead toward even higher chance to find this specific genetic variant. And many patients with a diagnosis of possible FH may have their elevated LDL cholesterol levels due to what we call a polygenic etiology, meaning they may have several smaller genetic effects all leading together to cause them to have that elevated LDL. And this can affect how high the risk is to their family members. It may be lower in a polygenic family. If we can identify the pathogenic variant, though, cascade testing branching out throughout the family can give a definitive diagnosis of FH and let us know who is at risk. Again, we have genetic testing for FH through multiple genetic testing laboratories. Not all labs are created equally. Some may not test all the same genes. Some may charge more or less, and some may work with health insurance while, while others may not. It is important for patients to go through pre-test genetic counseling and really learn about the benefits, but also the limitations, the possible results that may come back. And in fact, a study that was just published last year talked to people who had undergone genetic testing for FH where it was negative. And they found that they really felt uncertain about their results, and this was made worse by lack of information, not surprisingly. Patients expressed that they wanted to talk with a health professional following their results. And really we know that not only patients with positive results, but also those with negative genetic testing need to have follow-up in information so that they can truly understand the meaning of this negative result, understand that it doesn't necessarily mean they don't have FH, and understand how this might impact their children's risk. Again, it's been phenomenal the advances we've seen in genetic and genomic testing. We have now what's called next generation DNA sequencing. We can analyze not just one gene at a time with DNA sequencing, but large panels. And this has led to the development of panels of genetic tests called FH panels, or maybe even more inclusive lipid disorder panels, not just testing for FH, but similar or related conditions. With certain laboratories, you can even design your own genetic test. And a newer test that had been in the research realm for many years but has now moved into the clinical realm of genetic testing is called whole exome sequencing. And this is a real possibility for patients with FH who have undergone genetic testing but have no DNA variant identified because this test looks at the information on the DNA sequence of all 24,000 coding genes in the human genome. 
This will help us identify novel causes of FH. Beyond even that is whole genome sequencing, which goes beyond just the genetic code that makes the protein, but even other types of DNA in your body as well. Right now, this really is in the research realm for the most part, but may move into the clinical realm if we find it to be helpful with conditions like FH as well. Again, just the technology is amazing. It's making our DNA sequencing costs go lower and lower. And here you can see in blue the cost per megabase, which is a piece of DNA sequencing, compared to Moore's Law. And Moore's Law really describes how fast technology is increasing and changing. And you can see that even compared to Moore's Law with the technology we have available in general, DNA sequencing technology has exponentially increased and gotten better and cheaper. And here's a paper from the journal Genetics and Medicine showing specifically how this type of DNA sequencing improvements has led toward better and more cost-effective genetic tests specifically for FH and will hopefully help us lead toward more patients who not only have an LDL-based diagnosis of FH, but maybe even a molecular diagnosis, which can hopefully give more information for the proband and their family as well. There are other genetic lipid disorders in addition to familial hypercholesterolemia, which is also sometimes called this autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia. And so there are other genes that are important, and if the diagnosis of FH is in question, patients should also be evaluated to see if they potentially have one of these other types of genetic lipid disorders. Typically, a lipid disorder expert would be the one who would need to evaluate you for these, and this would be important because there may be different inheritance patterns and treatments for some of these. So what do the guidelines say about genetic testing? Well, I have listed four different guidelines here all from not only the United States, but other countries as well, including an international FH Foundation guideline that was published just earlier this year. And really, most of the guidelines agree that if possible, genetic testing should be offered to all index cases who have been diagnosed with FH based on their clinical presentation. Most of the guidelines also agree that if we have a genetic diagnosis, that information should be used for testing family members. And it's also been specifically noted that patients who are undergoing genetic testing should go through genetic counseling. So I'll go ahead and stop with that section as well before we go to the next. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, so we have several great questions. I'm gonna try to combine a couple of them. Um, uh, and I would love it if you would comment on what what test is needed to confirm FH. For example, the difference between you know is, is a clinical a clinical uh, determination of FH versus is genetic testing required for the diagnosis? Um, how early can can one test for FH, either clinically or genetically? And uh, how do people get the genetic test? So um, for, to, to tackle the first question first, sometimes FH can be diagnosed clinically, and there are different sets of diagnostic criteria, um, not only in this country in the United States, but also based out of the Netherlands and the United Kingdom. And, and we know that the genetic test can give more confirmation if it's positive that a person indeed does have FH. And so if you find a genetic variant in, say, for example, the LDL receptor gene, that will confirm the diagnosis. Sometimes having the cholesterol values, the family history information, physical signs of the condition, um, and clinical condition themselves in a patient such as early onset or premature coronary heart disease would be enough to provide a definitive diagnosis of FH. And so they really are complementary. Um, sometimes a diagnosis of FH is probable. It's not completely clear or definite. And I think in those cases, too, genetic testing can really help confirm that diagnosis. Now, as far as how young can testing be done, 
Genetic testing can be done really at any point in the life cycle. Genetic testing can even be done prenatally while a woman is pregnant. Genetic testing can be used for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is a technology that some couples choose to entertain and use. And genetic testing can also be done when a child is born. And really, I will get on some of the information about screening of children in the next section, but it's even recommended to screen children in FH families at a young age because it's very important to know if they do have FH or not so that certain interventions can be um, started if necessary. And as far as genetic testing, um, genetic testing for FH is offered in the United States by several different genetic testing laboratories. Um, I would recommend that you seek out a knowledgeable healthcare provider who knows about genetics, whether it be a lipid specialist or a genetic counselor or a cardiologist with expertise in genetics. Um, I would recommend that you do seek out uh, genetic testing from a knowledgeable healthcare provider who will go through all the information with you, both pre-test and post-test. Um, and I'll cover a little bit more about that in the genetic counseling section too. Okay. Um, there was one other question about uh, compound FH, the, you know, homozygous, compound heterozygous. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Now, the true um, definition of homozygous FH, uh, I, I think I know um, you can actually talk about that in different ways. Um, homozygous FH purely just talking about the genetic definition means that a patient has two copies of the exact same genetic variant. Compound heterozygous means that a person has two genetic variants causing FH, but they are two different variants. And then heterozygous FH means that a person has one genetic variant causing them to specifically have the condition heterozygous FH. Now, other ways to define homozygous FH might be, if we don't have genetic information, just based on how very high is the LDL cholesterol level, how early do they present with coronary heart disease or other features, including um, significant physical findings, like xanthomas or other types of lipid deposits on the skin or body. And so um, there, there's a few different ways to really think about that. But if I'm talking specifically just about the genetics, homozygous means you have two copies of the exact same mutation. Heterozygous means you have two genetic mutations, but they're, but they're two different ones. Okay, I think we should move to the next section and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for um, some remaining questions. Sounds great. So I wanted to now touch on genetic counseling. And for those of you who may never have had formal genetic counseling, I wanted to go ahead and define that for you so you know that this is available for all of you. Genetic counseling is the process of helping people understand and adapt to the medical, psychological, and familial implications of genetic contributions to disease. Really, all three of these are included. Interpretation of family and medical histories, Education is the main part of genetic counseling about inheritance, testing, management and prevention, and also provision of a lot of resources and potential research options. And it really is based on informed choices for patients, patient-centered care, and helping patients and their family adapt to the risk and manage it. Genetic counseling is recognized for its many positive contributions, specifically for patients with inherited forms of heart disease, and I think very importantly, it's indicated regardless of whether or not a genetic test will be performed. I've met with multiple patients who have FH or possible FH, and for some of these patients, we don't even pursue genetic testing for one reason or another. But it's still very important for them to be able to go through the genetic counseling process and get all the information. There are multiple different service delivery models. In person, of course, is one of the most common, but there's also telephone, telegenetic, and patients can really receive this type of information even in the comfort of their own home or in their office. 
This is a headline from an American Heart Association policy statement focused on genetics and cardiovascular disease. And you can see that this expert group strongly advocates involving physicians and centers with expertise in cardiovascular genetics for these conditions and for genetic testing because they will provide genetic counseling. This is a website for all of you to have access to, the National Society of Genetic Counselors, or NSGC.org. And you can see down here in the corner, if you're interested in trying to locate a genetic counselor in your area, you can click on this tool and search by zip code. Many genetic counselors, as shown here by this data from the 2012 NSGC Professional Status Survey, do work in the hospital setting whether it be a university medical center or a private or public hospital. But there are also genetic counselors who work at not-for-profit organizations, laboratories, whether it be a research laboratory or a commercial genetic testing laboratories, pharmaceutical companies, health advocacy organizations, or other places. The process of genetic counseling includes several different steps. And I like to kind of say that I feel like we do a lot of detective work to help the family put all the pieces and parts together for a solid diagnosis and for information. Oftentimes when I'm seeing a patient with FH, we try to gather all of their old cholesterol panels to see what their untreated levels were, getting cholesterol panel results on family members to really help us and aid in the diagnosis, other types of medical records, death certificates, autopsy reports, I work with several different collaborating physicians who are able to perform physical examinations looking for physical signs of FH. And then again, so much of the process is education, learning and performing risk assessment for that patient, and of course, everything having to do with the genetic test is handled in genetic counseling, in addition to the result interpretation for genetic testing and giving all of that information back to the patient and their health care provider, in addition to screening, prevention, management recommendations, reproductive options, if applicable, provision of psychosocial counseling, and what we call anticipatory guidance. In other words, really helping newly diagnosed patients understand what it is they can expect, provide resources, and oftentimes I connect families with the same condition because maybe they've never even met someone else who has the same diagnosis or has FH like they do. And so we try to connect families we know would be open to talking to one another. We discuss DNA banking, which can be an option for some patients, and available research options like the Cascade FH Registry. We also really truly facilitate family-based care. With FH, it's a genetic condition, and it doesn't just affect that patient in front of you, but other family members of, as well. And this is so very important when we think about this whole topic of cascade testing. I touched on this earlier, but these are the recommendations for screening children for FH. Now, first of all, universal cholesterol screening is a grade B recommendation, which means it's a strongly recommended item for children ages 9 to 11. And this is from both the National Lipid Association and the National Heart and Lung Blood Institute. But for children who are in a family with premature cardiovascular disease or elevated cholesterol, cholesterol screening can be considered as early as the age of two. And actually at these younger ages is when cholesterol can even better discriminate who may or may not be affected in a family. I oftentimes find that patients are unaware of these screening recommendations. And so this is a big counseling point for me that I try to make sure every patient understands and that their children's pediatrician understands. So here we really summarize what we would focus in on for genetic counseling for FH. A lot of the things we've talked about, inheritance patterns, cascade screening, utility of testing, all of the information about FH and what needs to be done to treat it as well as reviewing online resources and providing more resources, like a dear family member letter that I'll show you, as well as referring, again, to the Cascade FH Registry. And I'd like to take just a few moments now to really tell you more about the Cascade FH Registry. I love this quote. Science tells us what we can do, guidelines tell us what we should do, and registries tell us what we're actually doing. And this is so very important because registries for many different, especially even what are 
considered rare conditions, have been able to tell us a lot about the gaps in care for patients with conditions like FH and how important future research is. So to introduce you a little bit more to the Cascade FH Registry, if you aren't familiar with it already, it stands for Cascade Screening for Awareness and Detection of FH. And really one of the main missions of this is to promote awareness of FH. As we know, like we talked about earlier, so many FH patients do not even know they have FH. So we want to increase this at both patient and provider levels. We want to identify patients with FH and ask them to enroll through clinics, through their home, through an online patient portal, through family-based screening, through cascade screening, because by gathering all of this data, we can see what really is happening out there in the real world, how patients are being diagnosed, or if they're not, how long it takes patients to get diagnosed, do they have their LDL levels where they need to be. And this will eventually contribute to what we know about FH, show what we don't know about FH, and hopefully increase better funding for FH research, impact policy decisions, whether it be at the state or national level for programs for FH, with the main goal of improving health outcomes for FH patients. There is an online patient portal that is easy to use where patients can log on, easily see if they're qualified, and enroll in the protocol. And this is a research registry, but I love that it says here, be part of the solution. Enter this registry, put in your information. You will gain so much. You will learn about FH. They will keep you posted on additional updates. And then you contributing your data will help inform future information and more research. So here really in summary just shows what the FH registry is trying to do and with, again, the goal of gathering this information, seeing what's really happening out there with patients so that we can better treat patients, improve health outcomes, and identify as many FH patients as possible. So now that we've touched on the registry, I'd like to just throw this slide up there so you can see all of the information that we put in a genetic counseling summary letter back to your referring physician and back to you after you've gone through genetic counseling. All of this information would be provided back to you, back to your medical record, back to you for sharing with your relatives. And we give you a copy of your pedigree for your records, a dear family member letter, again, information on Cascade FH, and if you went through genetic testing, a copy of your results so that if your particular genetic variant was identified, you can share that with all of your family members so they can then have genetic testing for your specific change. This is what we call our Dear Family Member Letter. And this is located on the resources page of the FH Foundation's website. And this was put together by the National Society of Genetic Counselors FH Working Group. So what we wanted to do was put together a tool that all of you could use to distribute, whether it be via email or social media or mail or in person, to all of your at-risk family members. Letting them know that you've been diagnosed, what FH is, that heart disease can be preventative treated, explaining what high cholesterol is, explaining what cholesterol testing is, explaining the autosomal dominant nature of the condition, as well as next steps. And you can see all of these specific next steps at the bottom of this page. And then on to the second page, we put in the guidelines, we give information about genetic counseling and other websites that we know are great, reputable resources for you to go to, how to find an FH professional, including an FH specialist, and the specific contact information for the clinic that they could go to that you went to. So we really hope that patients are able to use this as a, as a helpful tool to get their family members screened and that genetic counseling can promote family communication. Because cascade testing, we know, is so very important and critical for identifying as many people as possible with FH. Cascade testing, nuts and bolts of it, is that it is a process to systematically trace through a family in a stepwise fashion, starting with the index case and moving step by step by step until all patients with FH have been identified in the family. 
it should start with your first or close relatives and then to second and third degree. DNA testing again should be used if we know the specific DNA variant in the family. And then newly people that are diagnosed with FH in the family are giving us new relatives for then who else we need to move on to. This really helps identify patients as early as possible, get treatment initiated so that hopefully we can prevent any long-term consequences with that genetic variant predisposition. And in many different research studies, when cascade screening has been implemented, it's been shown to be cost-effective as well. In fact, the Centers for Disease Control Office of Public Health Genomics has classified cascade testing for FH as one of what they call their Tier 1 genomic applications. And this is right up there with things that are done standardly, like newborn screening and testing for certain cancer genetic conditions. And so again, this is a very important Tier 1 application that we know is even supported by the Centers for Disease Control. Now, there is a lot of discussion about what's the best way for us to really move forward with cascade screening and testing relatives. And we can really classify two different yet complementary approaches. One is proband or index patient initiated contact, and the other on the other side of this table is direct contact by the healthcare provider straight out to the at-risk relative. Now, we may not be able to of course do this due to privacy laws without the consent of the index patient. But you can see with proband initiated family contact, this is really the way we standardly approach genetics practice here in the United States, and it does protect the reality of the index patient by asking them to be the one to share this information with their family members. However, we know that sometimes information from the proband may not have as much as an, of an impact compared to if it were from a health professional. Probands have a lot on their plate, and they might not get around to contacting their relatives right away. And they also are not necessarily FH experts the second they get diagnosed or even, you know, the year or month they get diagnosed. And it's a lot to ask of them to provide accurate information to their relatives. With direct contact, we do need to consider privacy and confidentiality. And if this may potentially take away the right not to know and the respect for the at-risk family member's autonomy. But informing at-risk relatives that they're at 50-50 risk is not necessarily telling them they have FH, just that they have an increased chance. We know that overall it's likely that a tailored approach to each individual family is likely the best way to go, but we also know that a healthcare provider informing an at-risk relative may lead toward higher efficiency of screening, and this again takes the burden off the proband of having to contact their relative. There was a study published just this year about this whole concept. And this study interviewed patients who had had a genetic diagnosis of FH. And many stated that they felt their relatives didn't want to attend screening. They maybe had a very negative fatalistic outlook. They were in denial, potentially. They didn't want to know. Maybe they weren't motivated for whatever reason, or, or maybe even perceived that FH was of a condition, which we know is not true. Participants also just didn't feel sometimes that they really had the authority or influence to ask or persuade their relatives to come to a screening. And they did welcome more assistance from a healthcare provider. This study also concluded that clinicians should give clear information about FH, its seriousness, the necessity for medication and lifestyle changes to probands so they can share this with their relatives. As a healthcare provider, we need to manage the duty to warn versus privacy. But there is a whole idea of genetic malpractice, and this specifically talks about the lack of consideration to at-risk family members when there is an inherited disease in your patient. And we need to, as healthcare providers, consider not only our patient, but also their family members who are at risk. Therefore, index cases, even as recommended by the International FH Foundation recent recommendations, need to be given clear information about FH and health consequences of a misdiagnosis. 
There can be many different family dynamics that play a role when we're thinking about a genetic condition, whether it be FH or another condition. And overall, we try our best to encourage shared decision making, but we know that patients may feel different emotional issues, grief, guilt, blame, responsibility. We try to work with patients through these issues. Oftentimes, we talk with parents about their guilt and that their children may be at risk for the condition they have. And in this case, we try to emphasize the benefits of knowing that knowledge is power. Sometimes we'll see something called survivor guilt, where family members who don't inherit the risk have survivor guilt and feel guilty that, that they aren't going through perhaps some of the difficulties their affected or at-risk relatives are. It's also important to think about trying to avoid coercing your relatives. We shouldn't nag our children overboard because this could lead toward relationship breakdown even though we know that we want to talk with them, again, in a shared approach to decision making. Again, we need to think about maintaining privacy, confidentiality, and of course the possibility when we're talking about genetic information of non-paternity being revealed. I always get asked about genetic discrimination. And we do have a federal law in this country called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act it was signed into law in 2008, and it specifically prevents health insurance companies from denying coverage, changing health premiums, or discriminating on genetic information. And this includes family history and positive genetic test results. This law also protects against employer discrimination. The lack, however, is that we do not currently have protections for life insurance, disability, or short-term disability insurance. In summary, I hope that you can feel empowered to know that you can help win the what we call FH battle. Knowledge is power. And I love this quote from this article published in the European Journal of Human Genetics back in 2005. Our biology does not stop. The risk of developing coronary heart disease as a consequence of FH will still be present, even if relatives live in ignorance. And so I hope this can prompt the sharing of information to family members, informing individuals if they may have FH. And here are some resources for all of you, some of the websites I've mentioned, NSGC. These next two bullet points refer to genetic testing um, availability from two different websites. And finally, again, the Cascade FH Registry, a wonderful tool not only for you to enroll in, but also to help the future of FH research. So that is my last slide. Thank you very much. I know we're close to time, but I'm happy to take a couple more questions. And I also want everyone to know that I'm more than happy to speak with you and follow up um, if we don't have a chance tonight at a later time. Thank you, Mr. Mouts. Fantastic, really excellent. A lot of information there that I hope our members and our advocates um, have learned from. Um, I, and we can stay on for some for some questions, but I know some people will uh, have to jump off. So I just wanted to to say thank you to you, uh, Ms. Sturm, and also to thank everybody who's uh, participated this evening. We really appreciate it. We very much appreciate the support of our. FH advocates for awareness and our uh, and our members. We rely on you. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of resources. Obviously, the the Cascade FH registry, also the Find an FH specialist map on our website if you're looking for somebody um, to treat you, and um, and also to point out how important community is. I know in the presentation we heard about you know trying to hook people up together with the people who have been diagnosed with FH and supporting each other, and that's what we're all about, and um, I hope you'll you'll join us in, in providing that sense of community to other people with FH. So uh, with that, for everybody who can stay, I think we can do a couple more questions that we got in chat, or if anybody has one in chat, but otherwise I wanna say thank you so much. And I'll take, we've got a lot of thank yous on our chat page. So, uh, 
it, it really was just great being able to speak with you all tonight. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to make my slides available on the FH Foundation website. I know that this was also recorded. Um, I'm happy to help you locate any your area, like Kat said, specialist on the FH Foundation website. If you do want to pursue genetic testing or genetic evaluation, there's a whole network and lipid specialists across the country, um, and so they could hopefully be helpful to you too. All right. Well, I think it's, I think a lot of people are needing to sign off, so I'm going to say uh, I'm going to say thank you and conclude here. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody.